nice to see all of you. I hear there are good talks going on. So um, we would like to start to speak about our topic, which is running virtual machines on Kubernetes with Libvirt and KVM. So before we start, let me introduce myself. So my name is Fabian Deutsch. I'm, I started off with Fedora and a few other Linux distributions quite a few years ago. And I'm now working for Red Hat on virtualization in, in Overt and now on Kubert. And yeah, I'm Roman Moore, I was working for Red Hat. And yeah, I contributed more or less in many open source projects. And I'm working for the last years on Overt and I also switched over to Kubert to bring virtual machines to Kubernetes. Right, so let's dive into it. So we are looking to run virtual machines on Kubernetes, but why the heck would we do that? Um, anybody who knows Kubernetes knows that it's not so much intended for running virtual machines right now, but why are we looking at that? So virtualization is here today and has been here for quite a while, for many years. We are all here because we optimized virtualization in the recent years to be running very good in, in our private scale, you know, on the small scale on our laptop, or in our lab at home, or in, in universities, or at the broader scale in the public cloud and private clouds. So virtualization is here and has a lot of users. So there's a lot of, a lot of applications are, are created to be working optimized in virtual machines. A lot of stuff is there optimized for virtualization. But as we know, containers are coming up as well. So containers is that buzzword which Docker, and we really recognize them, to have brought containers up to, to a usable state. So containers, you know, they look, taste, and smell the same, like, like VMs, just so much better than VMs. So they will actually solve everything. All the problems we have with virtual machines, they are more efficient, they are versati uh, versatile, they are scalable. You can put more containers on a single host than VMs eventually. Um, they're community-driven, and they're supporting DevOps, so they're just so good, you know, why, why do you need VMs anyway? You know, take that with a grain of salt. I mean, here we, we all know that they are technically different. But as a user, or even as an admin, you might ask yourself, how do we get there? How do we get to that brand new landscape where containers are all over the place and where there are so many fancy tools which we can use? I mean, it's not containers themselves which are there, but also a lot of supporting tooling. So you've got a range of projects which are there to support monitoring of containers, deploying containers, updating containers, doing all that kind of log aggregation and log collection across containers. So they're moving a little bit up the stack. So on the, in the virtualization world, we are pretty much on that operating system level. And they're moving up the stack to the application level and try to do all kinds of nifty stuff there, which can be efficient because it helps you to yeah, get, a bit in, uh, get a better insight of, of what is happening on your cluster. So at some point you might ask yourself, or users ask themselves actually today, how can I replace my VM with containers? I, I want to replace all my VMs because they're just so good and, and there's no Moby and, and Rocket, so all these fancy names, so what can I do? Before you can answer that, you actually need to see, or I just want to highlight that uh, we should ask ourselves, are containers really a substitute for VMs? And you need to consider that, that I mean, in the end it's a feature set, but there are many, many small differences between containers and VMs. So they speak about isolation, but containers, as you know, probably are based on C groups and namespaces, which give you a different guarantee than the virtualization we, uh, than in the virtualization world if we speak of isolation. Um, there are approaches in the container world to leverage virtualization for isolation as well. So you really need to look at your specific, you know, workload and requirements of the application you're running inside your VM today to, to understand if you can move it over uh, to a container. It's, it's not so straightforward. So in the end, it can be or it, can that, uh, it cannot be. It really depends on your workload. But if you get into that situation and then ask yourself, so now I've got my specific VM here, I've got my 20 VMs, my 1,000 VMs, and I want to migrate them over because there is this container world, there are container systems, container management systems. They are lean, they are good to manage, they integrate well with my monitoring and logging tools. So I want to see that I move some of my, my VMs over. So if you can do that, if, if your app is really, or your workload is really um, well 
well optimized or not well optimized, but rather well, well suited to be moved over to containers, then that's really cool. Go ahead and do it. But in reality, as said, we've got a lot of legacy or not legacy applications, but classical application monoliths, which were built over the last decades to fit into our virtualization world and what's with them. Can you move them over if they're depending on specific virtual hardware, if they are tuned towards specific properties of the virtualization environment? Then you might say, oh, I can't move them right now. I need some more time to, to modify my application to be, to be able to move it over to that um, other world. Or sometimes you say, I, I don't even want to uh, move my workload. In reality, you probably have both. So you have some VMs which you can replace right away, like your web server, your Nginx instance, or your tens of thousands of Nginx instances you have. But there are others like VDI um, setups where you cannot just replace a VM with a container. Um, so in the case that you can um, move your workload from a container to a VM, uh, from a VM to a container, you're looking for a migration path. So we all know it's not like the snip of a finger to get it from a VM to a container, but you rather need to see, okay, I've got my production workload and I now want to really take it serious. I did my POC, I did my private setup, but how do I now get my, my production setup, my production VM into, into a container? So you need a migration path, you need to have an idea, how, how do I do that? And in the end, if you say, if I can't replace my VM, then for the production case I need to consider, so right, now, now I, do I need a second infrastructure just to run my, 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 my containers? So I need to keep my production ready virtual machine infrastructure, I need to add a second infrastructure set um, to, to support containers to the same degree of, or in the same, in the same manner, in the same production ready manner. There are separate ways of how that double infrastructure can look. You can either put it side by side or you can stack it on top of each other. I mean, OpenStack and Kubernetes is a common combination. But at least you have got two infrastructure layers which you need to manage. So as said, in the end, you need both, virtualization and containers, probably for quite a while. And that is where Kubert comes in. And now we get to the point and it will be now a bit more specific. So Kubernetes is exactly about that. So Kubernetes is about running containers and virtual machines on the very same infrastructure so that we reduce the burden from the user to maintain two separate infrastructure sets. And we even give the user the ability um, to manage them um, on that same infrastructure with the same API. Um, so how does it look? Um, it will allow you to use the same management plane, or it does allow you, we have it today, and we'll get into the details in a moment. We have the management plane, um, which is taking care of managing, managing your storage and network, and even all that other cluster aspects, like scheduling and resource management, resource aware scheduling, that kind of stuff. And you are, you are able to run your virtual machines on that, and then gracefully move over containers as you like. So you can transition parts of it, or you can keep your VMs in the end if you cannot migrate your stuff. So, tell me more. Um, now we get really to, to how that's done. Our orchestrator, our management layer is Kubernetes. So because Kubernetes has come up in the container world um, as an orchestrator for containers, there are others, like there's Mesos, which is a bit low level eventually, and Docker Swarm, uh, which emerged and is now, uh, I wouldn't say deprecated, but um, not as safe, favorable anymore. Um, but Kubernetes at least allows you to use your cluster uh, cluster resources. So storage network are, are classical resources on your cluster. And Kubernetes allows you to, to use them. And today, Kubernetes allows you to use those cluster resources with containers. But it doesn't allow you to, to run virtual machines on it. So as simple as it is, <laughs> um, you just add Kuber to that mix and, and you're able to run virtual machines um, on that same infrastructure through the same API. And now I'm handing over to Roman to let him say how that really works in the detail, if you want to use that one. Okay, so, good. So uh, I think before I start with how we integrate with Kubernetes, it's probably a good idea for all those people's, people which so far successfully avoided Kubernetes and OpenShift. Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, deploying and scaling and managing containerized applications. With other words, you can manage your containers on a cluster scale. And um, 
but you're not directly managing uh, containers there, you are actually managing a workload called pod. And a pod is a sum of containers um, which share storage and network and um, you have a specification which you post to the runtime and that then Kubernetes will do the work for you. Here you have an example of a pod definition. You have a kind which says that it's a pod, it's a YAML manifest. You have a metadata section where you can give the workload a name, you can add labels to it which are useful for identification or for scheduling. You have a specification section where you can describe your containers which run in that pod. You have uh, the possibility to specify selector, selectors for a node placement which is uh, useful for the scheduler. You have a status section which tells you how your workload is processing, if it's done, if it's still running, all that stuff. And so whenever you talk about, con um, yeah, whenever you talk about containers in Kubernetes, you actually talk about pods. Um, now, there is one interesting uh, thing in Kubernetes, and that's they have on the node layer, they have, on the node level, they have their daemon running with this, the kubelet, and it is kind of a layer in front of different container runtime implementations. There is Docker, there is Rocket, and there are some hypervisor-based runtime implementations like Virtlet or Clear Container. You can go downstairs to the Intel uh, booth and th ask them about Clear Containers. There are some guys there. And uh, what they do is they, they take the container runtime specification and just start VMs instead of, of pods in there, uh, instead of containers in the end to provide you better isolation and security. Um, and now one could think, yeah, with our general, with our approach to support generic VMs, we could do pretty much the same thing. We can just implement another container runtime implementation, put all the details about the devices into the annotation section, uh, go to every node, roll out our, our own container runtime implementation, have, have to deal with a few quirks like when I migrate a VM, I finally have two pods running at the same time and I'm, it's hard to see where is actually my VM really running in. Is it that pod or is it that pod? Um, and of course, make sure that you really support all parts of what a container runtime needs to implement. And that's actually s built to suit the needs of containers and not virtual machines. So it's a hard chase to do that right. And finally, for the user, it's really hard to see are we now talking about a VM pod, which is actually a VM at the end, or is it a pod pod? And so a different approach might be to um, extend the Kubernetes API and provide a proper virtual machine specification, which is structured in the way a pod specification would look like, but which really allows you to express your virtual machine needs in an API built for expressing them. Farther, you can then say, I really want to run my VM inside a pod instead of running it instead of a pod. That allows you to really ship on top of Kubernetes without having to modify the host at all. So you can really just have your set of daemon sets and manifests which you roll out on Kubernetes and you just get the virtualization functionality there. Uh, Farther, if you have a real virtual machine endpoint, you can you can always talk to that virtual machine endpoint to see how your virtual machine is processing, no matter if you need one or more pods, maybe 10 pods to provide all the infrastructure to properly feed the VM with, with everything it needs. You just have one VM and you can really just go there and say that's my VM and then go on from there instead of trying to chase the right pods to see what's going on. Uh, farther, when we run the virtual, would run the virtual machine inside a pod, we can already leverage the whole pod functionality which Kubernetes provides us. Instead of having to replicate it, we can build on top of it. And finally, the user can really talk about VMs when he talks about VMs on Kubernetes and about talks when he talks about pods on Kubernetes. Uh, so when we talk about KubeWord, we think about it as a virtual machine API in Kubernetes with uh, a runtime for virtual machines on top of Kubernetes which is not a container runtime implementation. When we look at the details, how we're doing that internally, here it gets more interesting regarding to Libvirt and KVM. Um, so we have on the, on the cluster level, we have an additional API server to the Kubernetes API server, which can be, or, 
which in the future can also be tied into the API server as a one-class citizen with their aggregated API server concept. So it's really a native extension to Kubernetes. Kubernetes provides us that functionality. Um, and on the end, a set of controllers which do all the work for us. And on the node, we just have the typical Kubernetes, which is the Kubernetes daemon. And inside of pods, we actually deliver all our infrastructure. And you have one pod on every node which delivers Libvirt with QEMO, and we have in that and we have another part which also delivers our daemon, who is more Kubernetes suited to translate between Libvirt and Kubernetes. And when we then start a, a, a virtual machine, you just post a virtual machine, machine specification to your runtime. And the controllers make sure that you start a pod and schedule a pod for that virtual machine. And then on the node where it was scheduled, uh, we tell Libre to place the virtual machine as an application inside that pod. And now the virtual machine specification itself can really be expressed very nicely in real Kubernetes terms. You can just have another manifest which has the kind of virtual machine. You can have a metadata section again where you can add names, annotations, and everything. You can have your specification, in this case, um, in the devices section, we just attach a persistent volume claim that's a specific type of volume in Kubernetes to the virtual machine. But you can also pass through liberate low-level details there if needed. Um, we can have cluster-specific stuff there, like node selection hints for the scheduler, and status, which shows you if your VM is running, if it's migrating, all that kind of stuff. And that all gives you also the typical kubectl feeling when you're using Kubernetes. When you use pods in Kubernetes, you have the kubectl tool, which allows you to create pods out of the manifest file. You can just delete them with the command line. You can enter the containers, which are running inside the pods remotely via kubectl exec. And for virtual machines, we get pretty much for free with a little bit of integration work almost the same functionality for virtual machines. We can create virtual machines out of manifests. We can delete virtual machines. We can access consoles where a WebSocket there. We can, uh, we can fetch spice connection details and open with spice connections. And that all gives a really nice feeling regarding to be part of Kubernetes and, and regarding to reuse of Kubernetes. And there is, apart from this basic integration, there is one is interesting additional difference to what pods are compared to, to virtual machines, and that, that you, can, you can migrate virtual machines, but you can't migrate, migrate pods. Uh, I've already talked about it briefly before that if we would migrate a virtual machine, we would have to schedule two pods since they can't migrate themselves. And so we came up with another migration object in Kubernetes where you can where you have a specification which allows you to, to influence the target of the migration with the node selector here. Here I'm just telling Kubernetes with the kubert.io slash host name node one key value pair that I want to migrate my virtual machine to node one. And with the selector, I can select the actual VM, which is called test VM. And you have a status again where you see if the migration succeeded or not. And this migration object in combination with the virtual ma machine object or specification provides us the same kind of abstraction like, we, like Kubernetes provides with pods. Pods are the, are the atomic workload type in the Kubernetes world. In our world, we can now take migrations and virtual machines and take everything, all the functionality we need on top of these atomic workloads. But, I mean, that, while that all is great, that all also involves a lot of thinking on how the right API should look like and uh, it's actually pretty challenging because, on one hand, our API should be as powerful as Liberty is, and Liberty is pretty powerful when you look at their domain XML. But on the other hand, it's, all, it's not just a node API, a node specific API, it's also a cluster API. So there are some features which should be expressible on the cluster level, there are some features which, but they should be protected by access control, there are features which shouldn't be because they need to be abstracted away. Then we have, then Kubernetes has, its, has their own concepts, which uh, regarding the storage and networking, which not necessarily fit one-to-one -one on Libvirt, so we have to do a lot of translation work and thinking there. 
And of course, the most important difference is that while in our traditional management applications, we are used to do all our work imperative, Kubernetes completely works declarative. So we have to do a lot of background work to actually synchronize our states of the virtual machines with that what you want. In, in, and that's completely different when you think about for over for instance, there also, it just tells the node what to do. It's completely different in Kubernetes. You just tell the complete cluster what you want from it, and then internally everything starts working and tries to fulfill that, and later on you then see, yeah, it worked or it didn't work. And that's a huge challenge. Uh, further, we have uh, a ver a ver another very important challenge is how to properly integrate the virtual machine lifecycle with the pod lifecycle on a node. Um, and there, for instance, they have, there you have all kinds of differences. For instance, that Kubernetes normally talks about volumes when they talk about st storage. So you have uh, iSCSI backends, you have cluster backends, Ceph backends, and all that kind of stuff. But whenever they mount something and provide something to you, they normally just mount the directory and you can write there and read there. That's not really what we need. We need disks which we attach to virtual machines. So on one hand, there is a lot of infrastructure work already done for us to attach all that somehow to our node or to express it on the cluster level, but it's not really done in the way we need it. And so a lot of work is going on there. Uh, regarding to networking, that's also pretty challenging because Kubernetes has its own networking model, which basically says we don't care about networking at all. We just tell an external provider, uh, um, give us an IP which should be the IP of the container, and then we just propagate it around the cluster. And that's not really how it works with virtual machines. In virtual machines, uh, you, you can't just configure your, your controller, uh, you can't just configure your, your uh, container or your virtual machine with the IP inside. You just have to go through DHCP servers and all that kind of stuff. So it's actually the entry point for networking is different. We have to configure the VM from outside, whereas Kubernetes is used to, yeah, let the networking namespace be configured right and then give us the IP and we report it everywhere. Um, another interesting issue or task which is on our list to solve is that we have QM and Liberty inside a pod. Um, I'm not aware how, of how many of you are aware of the fact that if for a very long time it was the case that if you just restarted your Docker daemon on a node in Kubernetes, all your, uh, all your containers suddenly stopped. Uh, now with Cryo, that's no longer an issue. That's an, another implementation for the Docker container runtime implementation. But we basically have the same issue right now with Liberty and QEMU pod. If we restart our Liberty pod, all our QEMU instances are still somehow bound to the mount namespace of the Liberty pod and are stopped. So when you then think of this combination of you restart Docker, all your containers go away, and if you restart Liberty, all your VMs go away, that's kind of a fragile thing. So we're still trying to find the right solution for that part. Um, also, we have to integrate with the C groups of the pod so that the scheduling decisions and the, the resource usage of the virtual machine is really taken into account properly. And yeah, we have to provide migration on top of Kubernetes, which itself doesn't have any concept of migration. So we have to make sure that the timings are right everywhere, that we really the VM is already, already gone away before the pod terminates and all that stuff. Right now, we already provide a kind of an interesting set of features. We have cloud unit support on the on, on Kubert right now. You can access consoles and spice. We have a virtual, virtual machine replica set based on Kubernetes, which allows you to scale your virtual, so ephemeral virtual machines up and down. That works pretty nicely. And we have a cloud, cloud provider implementation for Kubernetes, with, and Kubernetes has a project which allows you to scale your Kubernetes nodes on Amazon Web Services or on Google Cloud Engine. And we also have a cloud provider plugin for Kubert, which works on bare metal Kubernetes installations to scale nodes on Kubernetes installations, which are nested inside there. So you can kind of, and you can, Kind of have kind of two different nodes there. You can have your real nested Kubernetes cluster in, inside those scaled environments, or you can just provision additional nodes for the bare metal installation, which are virtualized, which allow you to separate some workloads from others. And there's a lot more to come. And now I'm giving, getting, giving back to Fabian too. Oh, I forgot the demo. We also have a nice demo if you want to try it out. Yeah, forget about that, but it's very important. 
So there's a Minikube demo, which, uh, and Minikube is a very famous demo tool in the Kubernetes world. You can just run these commands and that will start a one node Kubernetes cluster for you with uh, Kubert installed and then you can run the demo script and it will start a VM there. You can connect to the console and everything. And yeah, I'm happy if you will try it out. And now I'm giving over to Fabian. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, we've seen quite much. So we've started quite high on the high level looking at, you know, what, why do we do all of this at all? And then we looked at how, how do we do it actually? Um, so, and what's coming up? So we as Kubert, I mean, we, we had a lot of challenges doing on the, to, to, to face on the API level and on the node level. But what we really aim at, our vision clarified a little bit, um, we want to become a, Kubernetes, a native Kubernetes add-on so that you can really deploy ourselves with a single command um, on your Kubernetes cluster. By the way, who of you ever tried Kubernetes? Ah, that is cool. And how many of you have, have tried either of Overt, Proxmox, or OpenStack? Oh, that's, that's interesting. It's like, it's a comparable number, so it's not significantly different. That's it. And who of you has tried Libvirt? Hmm, interesting. So there's no real, real dominant player in here, but it, that's interesting. Never mind. So whenever you try uh, Kubernetes, you will be able to deploy Kubert with a single command line. We're not there yet. We made good progress on that, but we're not there yet. In order to achieve that, we need to stabilize. So we're doing a lot of changes because we are experimenting. We try to see what solution is fitting best, you know, and as you know it, we're going forward, we see this is not working out as we expected, so we, we need to choose a different path. But we want to stabilize in order to be able to be easily deployable on different clusters. Because you need to understand Kubernetes um, has a lot of commercial distributions. So it's like with, with OpenStack. We see that different vendors provide their support and their specific version with eventual add-ons. And in Kubernetes, it's the same. So many vendors have their distribution of Kubernetes, and we want to see that we are really agnostic to, to that specific distribution and, um, yeah, agnostic to the specific distribution. And contributing to Kubernetes. Um, so the thing is, we come with the background of, of, of Overt, but we have also people from OpenStack looking into Kubert and contributing. And our background is that we come from management systems. And we're used to implement a lot of stuff managing clusters. So we have our specialists about doing storage, about doing networking, doing virtualization and scheduling. And the interesting bit here with Kubert is what, what are we intended to do? Because Kubernetes is already doing so much. Kubernetes is doing everything. Kubernetes is so amazing, but it can't do everything yet. So there are bugs and, and, and our work changes. So we want to do, we want to develop um, a virtual, we want to enhance Kubernetes to be able to run virtual machines decently and we can manage them. But in order to do so, we need to improve Kubernetes as well. So our focus is not exclusively on improving Kubert itself, but also improving Kubernetes to, to provide what we need. One example is, for example, block storage. In Kubernetes so far, um, Kubernetes provides storage as file systems. But if you're not using VertFS, um, then you need raw block storage in order to use it with QEMU. Um, you can, you, you know, you can use files and, or I don't know, there's a um, device mapper NFS block drive, if I'm not mistaken, so you could use that as well. But in reality, we want a block device in order to use it with QEMU. And so we want from Kubernetes that they provide block devices to us so that we can efficiently use those volume concepts with our VMs. And that is what we need to push. And there are other areas, like we've got custom virtualization specific metrics we need to be able to expose them to the cluster to make the Kubernetes scheduler able to consider them when doing scheduling decisions. And that is the kind of stuff which we don't want to solve on our side, but rather work with Kubernetes to see that we enhance it so that it's useful for us, but also eventually for others. Because in the end, the problems we have are sometimes also applicable to others, like the block storage is also interesting, for example, for database workloads. All right. So that's what we also want to foster to start looking to Kubernetes and contributing more over there. So, and we're getting to the end. So the summary is that Kubernetes is, is a lot of work in progress and a lot of R&D. Um, 
And there's a lot of stuff happening on the Kubernetes side and on the Kubernetes side. And if you've got many moving parts, then it's a great party if you have the right party lights. Um, but we also see that we, with the work which Roman presented, we are able to provide a unified API. Um, so what does that mean? We do have our specific API to manage virtual machines on top of Kubernetes, but by adding that to Kubernetes itself, you then have an API which provides you with both. So you have an API to manage containers, and on, on the same transport level, you have this, another API or more resources to manage virtual machines. So in the end, as a user, as an admin, as a developer, you've got a single pane of glass to manage both your VMs and your uh, container workloads. And at the same time, um, as I highlighted in the beginning, um, you, you can end up with a converged infrastructure. So that means, what does it mean effectively? It means you can deploy Kubernetes ones on your bare metal, or even in nested in OpenStack if you want to try it out. But on bare metal, you can deploy Kubernetes and you can use that very same infrastructure for both of your workloads. So you don't have to do Kubernetes on top of OpenStack or the other way around, OpenStack and Kubernetes, or Kubernetes on Rev or Overt. You don't have to do that, but you can rather use that one infrastructure. Um, yeah, and we are actually there today, and so now it's about improving and stabilizing um, what we have. Um, all right, I think we finished quite on time. I th uh, thank you very much for your attention, um, and now it's time for questions, if there are any. And if you have a question, there's actually the opportunity to win a small sticker of a limited set of Kubert stickers, a very limited set. Can you hear me? Can you explain a little bit more about the declarative versus imperative modes? Where do you see it in OpenStack and over it, and how do you resolve it or not? Yeah, yeah. So the question was, can we explain a little bit more about declarative against imperative? So one nice thing about Kubernetes is that you declare the state of the cluster. So if we look at, let's take over it. I know it best personally. So in over it, you go to the API and say, I want to create a VM. So you do a create API call to create that VM. You need a disk, so you do an API call to create a disk. <clears throat> and if your cluster now goes down because your house burned or the lab was destroyed by your dog, uh, you need to do the same API calls in order to bring up the same cluster again. In Kubernetes, it's different. So there it's declarative. So you declare the state of the cluster you want to have. So you say, I want a VM, and put that declaration into Kubernetes. Um, and you say, I want that specific, I want that volume to be available. And then it's so-called designed around the operator pattern. Then there are operators in the cluster which see these declarations and perform the API calls on behalf of you. So they will do the right calls to bring up a VM or to schedule a VM on the cluster and get it up and running or to create a disk um, using some storage backend. Why does it make a difference? Because in this, is a, in this example where the cluster went down, um, if you bring up the cluster again, the declarations are still there and the operators are also there again. So the operators will see that the declarations are there and see, well, my cluster state is different, so I do everything in order to, to get my cluster into the declared state. And so you, don't, you are not um, requested to do the same API calls again and build up your cluster, but rather um, the cluster itself is working on, on reaching that state. And that's very handy um, in case of disaster recovery, for example. Now, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, do you have an ex expectation how long it will take that you get in sort of stable mode, so to say that you uh, are able to pre-production use, like like uh, not only in Minikube, but but also to really get it running in a real environment? As far as I understood in the in the uh, documentation, uh, we are able to yeah apply the plugins in Minikube, but not yet on a real running um, Kubernetes uh, environment. So um, when will we, be, will, be, will we be more stable was the question. <clears throat> um, soon. <laughs> um, no, in reality, we've, we've got to, so as I said, we're, I think not too long. So I think we can think in weeks. Um, 
We've been struggling with that for quite a while, um, but we, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, what does it mean? So um, we are actually working on all important points to make the manifests we have agnostic to a cluster. And that is the most important step to, to be able to deploy us to other, um, to other clusters. But about um, pre-production quality, I think that will still take some time. So um, I, I can't tell yet when we will reach that because it's really, yeah, it's, you know, the parts are moving. Some features we need, like the Roblox source support Kubernetes is just coming up. Or if we think about who is using virtual machines with multiple NICs, I think that a lot of people are doing that, and that's currently not possible with, with stock Kubernetes. So, and this work, for example, in the networking area is really just emerging. I mean, Kubernetes is just starting to think that it might make sense to have multiple NICs or multiple IP addresses per pod, which is necessary for us to provide multiple, IP, uh, multiple NICs to a virtual machine. Um, so to rephrase, depending on the feature set, could be sooner or later. Oh, and you get, both of you get a sticker. Actually two, because there are not so many questions anymore. Okay, I think going once, twice, three, third time. Thank you very much for attending, have a good day.